I will say this, when you've produced a piece of work, it feels very personal to you. This is your baby. You've put something of yourself into this work. And it's not easy for people to send it to competitions. Now for somebody to judge a baby and say if it's ugly or pretty, right? Now this is a, it's something that's so personal to you. But I think what I have learned over the years when I send stuff to competitions is let it go. So what if writing a book is not just a way to transform the lives of many people, but also a way to create financial freedom and leave a legacy? Wouldn't you want to find out just how to do that? Well, that's what this show is all about. Hi, I'm Henneke Watkiss, sporter, speaker, coach, author of Podcasts Power and the host of the Entrepreneurial You podcast, inviting you to listen to the Entrepreneur Secrets podcast brought to you by C. Ruth Taylor, best selling in the author and the Caribbean's most trusted voice on entrepreneurship. Tune in for inspiration, information and innovation to write and win with books. Get ready to dominate entrepreneurship. Greetings, entrepreneurs. Welcome to another episode of the Entrepreneur Secrets Podcast. This is episode 19. I'm your host, C. Ruth Taylor. We want to make the Caribbean the home of independent publishing so that you can write, publish, and leverage books for maximum impact and income. But today we are taking a short detour to focus on one of our Caribbean authors who has gotten a two-part traditional book deal. We went to primary school together. Her mom taught me. We share the same last name. <laughs> and I'm so excited to have Dr. Sharma Taylor with us. And she's going to be telling us how we can win book awards and how to get that coveted <laughs> traditional deal which many people still want so let's talk about my own entrepreneurship ventures i announced last episode that i'm doing a rocket writer series well the series is still on it really is a three-part series because i write books fast right non-fiction books and dr taylor was saying that non-fiction books is harder but for me fiction is harder non-fiction is easy so what is my secret to write 20 books in a year? Well, one of the secret is that 24 hours does not necessarily mean the full day. It could be three, eight hour sessions. It could be, what is it? Four, six hour sessions. And it could be sometimes just eight hours of writing, eight hours of planning and that kind of thing. I have taken 11 hours sometimes the eight hours to get the content out then I go and polish that that is still fast but we're talking small books no more than 30,000 words so within eight hours you can get 17 20,000 words out so we're talking about books of 10,000 to 30,000 words that's Ruth like books I'm encouraging small helpful books in Jamaica I would say little but talawa small but powerful books just like the book of ruth and each session is 19.99 but if you want to do the entire rocket writer series you can get the all access pass which is 47 us dollars and you just go to extra mileja.com slash rocket writer series and you will see the details idea to book then book to course then book to new ministry or business in 24 hours these are things that i have done and this is a steal of a deal knowing that the ideas you're gonna learn and the strategies you're gonna get will enable you to earn more and to write and publish books that will far exceed the cost of <laughs> this program that's it for the entrepreneurship ventures for this week before we get into the interview let's have a word from our sponsor frame art jamaica limited Come to Frame Art Jamaica Limited for your one-stop framing, graphic design, and printing needs. We frame photos, certificates, paintings, t-shirts, and so much more. You can also get high-quality prints and framing done in a quick turnaround time to fit your budget. Visit Frame Art Jamaica at 22C Old Hope Road, Kingston 5, weekdays 8.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. Call us at 876-929-3058 or visit us at info at frameartjamaica.com. Serving you for over 30 years. 
She's a multiple award-winning writer and a corporate attorney. She has been a recipient of the 2020 Wasa Theory Queen Mary New Writing Prize, the 2020 Frank Collymore Literary Endowment Award, and the 2019 Bocas Lit Pets Johnson and Amoy Achong Caribbean Writers Prize. Her debut novel, What a Mother's Love Don't Teach You, is scheduled to be published by Virago, part of Little Brown in the UK in summer 2022. Sharma was also shortlisted for the Commonwealth Short Story Prize in 2021, 2018, and 2020. She's on a roll. And without further ado, let's welcome Sharma to the show. Welcome, Sharma. Hi, Kamika. I am super excited to be on the show. I'm a big fan of the work you do, so I'm just thrilled to be here. And I am honored to have you. How did you get into writing or know that you were good at writing any at all? I think for me, because as a child, I read a lot and I used to use books as like my friends, you know, I had friends, but books allowed me to be introduced to new characters that I never would have met otherwise. So Enid Blyton books with the elves and the fairies, Nancy Drew books, Hardy Boys, and all those other worlds um, became my childhood world um, growing up. So I think if you keep filling your brain with images and ideas and books like that, it, it's a natural outflow that you yourself would want to write. And I remember probably it was like 10 or 11 when I wrote a historical fiction. And I remember a scene of a chariot going towards a cliff. I think it was kind of romance. And the lead guy was going to jump on the chariot and prevent it from going over the cliff to save the heroine. I don't know what I knew about any of that, but I just knew that for me, I just always, it came from a place inside that I just felt I need to always tell stories. And I went to St. Andrew High School after I left Seward All Age. And there I had an English teacher called Miss Bala who cultivated that in me and all the wonderful teachers at St. Andrew High School, including Dr. Lisa Tomlinson and so on, who really, really helped me to kind of say, all right, this is something you're good at because I'd get good marks when I did creative writing or they'd read my story to the class. And I sort of felt, hey, well, this is something that I, I love and I think I can do. So why not do it? And um, I went to a course with um, Wayne Brown, the late Trinidad writer who was living in Jamaica at the time, who was the editor of The Observer literary supplements and um, I, I entered Observer Short Story Awards and came second when I was about 16 or so and he said to me you know this is something that you should keep doing and I think when I got to law school now I stopped because I had to be reading legal textbooks doing legal essays I definitely left my creative writing behind and from the stretch of let's say 19 to maybe in my early thirties, I didn't, I didn't really write, you know, which is a big stretch of time. And I remember, um, having a kind of come to myself moment in like, which was maybe around eight years ago where I said to myself, but Sharma, you're not happy. And I had to ask myself, why was I not happy? You know, so my spiritual life was good, but I still felt unfulfilled. And it was that kind of epiphany where uh, my inner self or inner voice said you know you're not writing you will stop writing and that's the thing that brings you joy so I took a course with Dr. Erna Broadbuff who um, everybody is a fantastic Jamaican writer um, through UA. I did a short course with her that was open to the public I moved to Barbados for a job I did a further course with um, Dr. Jane Bryce in Barbados and through that sort of honing the craft and finding myself again that's when I think I, I rediscovered my love for writing. So that journey began about seven and a half years ago. That's awesome, Sharma. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've been winning uh, awards, writing awards from you are 16 years old. And I'm hearing too that the courses helped you, just like what Joanna Penn said. It is a skill that you can learn. So you did at least three courses I heard there from persons who understood this thing and how to tell stories. And I know you have a program coming out to help other Caribbean authors. But let's just get into winning awards how do you win writers or book awards what does it take because to be honest i am not so confident i in entering these things and uh, 
you know, I, I, I am sent the emails to enter the awards, but I am a little scared. So mm -hmm. talk to us. How, what are the steps? What's the process? And mm -hmm. what are the tips if you want to do it and win? So I want to start with the very first point being kind of what you just said, jumping off from that. There's a thing called imposter syndrome. I don't know if I've, or your viewers have heard of it, but there's a feeling that, and I remember being introduced to this when I was doing my PhD because my supervisor said, look guys, you know, you're writing a PhD. You're going to feel moments like, who am I to be doing a PhD? You will get that feeling. And my law professor, Susie Franklin, and she said, frankly, she's an academic and she has imposter syndrome too, you know? So she's like, you're never going to get away with, you know, from that feeling. There's always going to be a sense that somebody you snuck into the room and you're hoping you're not found out to be a complete and total fraud. And um, she says, you know, people will say, when she tells them that, they will say, okay, you know, professor, say what you like. The other people have the syndrome, but I'm the actual imposter. And, you know, because there's some people just, just, you know, so the, the point is accept the fact that fear is a normal part of the writing process. I remember reading an interview with uh, Marlon James a couple of weeks ago, and he said, every book project he embarks on, he feels fear because he wonders, is it gonna do as well as the one before? People are gonna like it or gonna say it's crap. So there, that is a natural process. If you write five books or you write 50, that fear is not going away. But the, I would say that the courageous writer is one who writes despite the fear. You know, you write through the fear. You tell the fear, okay, I'm writing now, come back at four o'clock. Let me get these couple hours done of writing and then you, you come back. So you, you talk to your inner voice and every major writer has that inner voice of doubt. You know, you're, you're your own worst critic. And so when you are creating, when you're in the creative process, you have to shut that internal critic or internal editor down. You know, you're free, right? You get the things out, you vomit on the page, you know, li not literally, but you know, in your words and you, and you let that inner child run free in terms of your creativity. And then you edit, you get, you look at it yourself, you get some trusted persons to read, do not send it to your mother, your brother, your sister, people just love you and going to tell you it's fabulous. Send it to people who have, who, are, who love to read, who read widely or who are writers and who can tell you mm, this worked for me or not and why. But you have to know, first of all, the story that you want to tell. Because at the end of the day, the point that, everybody listening to this needs to know when it comes to sending stuff to publication in a journal or whether it comes to entering in a competition there's a high degree of subjectivity i'm going to tell you the inside track the what's a few prize that i won for literature that same story i sent it to a journal i will not say the name of the journal and they wrote me back and basically tell me they're not going to publish it you know like oh it's just not for them they don't it, it, in their view it was not a strong enough story for them but yet it is the same story that won the Wasafiri prize. So uh, I'm trying to say to you that everybody's not going to love your stuff. So you have to research and see, is this the right place for me to submit to? Whether it's the right journal or it's the right competition. The way you would learn that in a journal, make sure that you read the back issues. Make sure you read the prior um, editions and you can get a sense of the style and the flavor of the journal to know, all right, is this right for me? Competitions, look at the past winners, which you normally would have on their website. Read and say, all right, is this a right fit for me? So that you can know whether you are entering what, what stands a good chance. But what I would say is the value of competitions as well is even if you don't win, you can get great feedback. So in other words, don't let it be all around, okay, I didn't win it, so it was a failure. You know, one of the biggest things um, in Barbados is a, the, they do an annual NIFCA award, which is kind of like Jamaica, JCDC, and you send your things in and they have sessions with the judges where they give you feedback. As soon as I moved to Barbados, I started entering that. You know, I got some bronze, some silver, some gold medals, but the most important thing for me was that I got feedback where the judges would say, this part worked, this part didn't work, and why? And you take that on board and, and own your craft. Because at the end of the day, whether or not a journal publishes you, whether or not you win a competition, you have to know that you are writing because you have no other choice but to write. So in other words, you so love writing that you can't but do anything else. 
and you, you want to be so true to your characters that you want to be so authentic, have an authentic voice that even if nobody publishes you, even if you never win a prize, this is the thing you can't help but do. And I was listening to an interview with Sherry Jones, who is a Barbadian fiction writer who's been, her, her debut novel has been shortlisted for a major prize in England, the Women's Prize. And she said, she just determined in her mind that writing is something she was going to do, whether or not she won a prize. And she's been doing it from her 20s and she's now in like her 40s, I think. And she's like, she does not make the accolades determine what and how and when she writes. She writes because she has a story to tell. She has a world she has to render and translate for a reader and she can't help but write. So I would say a writer should get that kind of compulsion where I must put this story into the world. Even if it don't win a prize, it will find the right reader. You know, it will connect with the right person. It will bring about change in somebody's life, which is the whole point of fiction. Right. So the other part of it is, and I know it, I would say this, when you've produced a piece of work, it feels very personal to you. This is your baby. You've put something of yourself into this work. And it's not easy for people to send it to competitions now for somebody to judge a baby and say if it's ugly or pretty. Right. Now, this is a, it's something that's so personal to you. But I think what I have learned over the years when I send stuff to competitions is let it go. So you have the baby and it's like you're shooting out the baby into the world and not giving another thought to the baby. Kind of sound like a careless mother, but really you're saying, you know, I've made you go out and make your way. If something happened, great. If something don't happen, great. Because the thing about it is you may not win a competition, you know, or maybe the judges don't award you something, but one of the judges may read it and say, you know what, I don't ever get a prize. I really like this story. He may be an editor in a journal somewhere and send it to somebody and say, hey, maybe we can publish this. Or I may think of you for a speaking opportunity or something. It's like, I feel like when it goes out in the world, nothing is lost. But you have to relinquish it. You have to know, okay, I've produced the work, but I'm letting it go. And the work is not me. If the judges don't like it, they're rejecting the story and not me. It, you have to find a way to separate your sense of self and identity from the story. Because even good writers will tell you sometimes they write crappy stories. You know, I have to be comfortable with writing something crappy too. I say, all right, well, it wasn't my strongest. You know, even though I write stuff and I may send it to my friends or our readers to, uh, and writers to view and they may say, well, boy, this story feels like it's two different halves and this is what you need to do to bring it together. And that feedback helps me, you know, and you just can't be too precious or take things too personally when it comes to your story. You know, you have to be able to share it in the world hear what people have to say judge for yourself whether you want to make those changes or it takes you from the authenticity that you are going for but at the end of the day you have to learn how to let your story go okay so we are hearing here in terms of winning book awards mindset is it and separate yourself from the work and just write because you love it so if i want to enter a book award or short story or even an award for non-fiction authors like myself what are the prizes that are available and the steps to doing mm. so so research is your best friend because now you can google and find all the things that are out there all things that i can ever tell you because I'm, I'm not necessarily up to speed on every single one but the ones i can say um there's a book as lit fest that happens out of trinidad every year i think around every may and they have various competitions so i won one for emerging writers as in a writer who hasn't published yet so that's the one i won in 2019 so look out on their website and see what competitions they have they have competitions for people who have published books in throughout the year as well so you can enter those ones. I think the Bocas Lit Fest is the major, major one within the Caribbean region. In Bar there are some in Barbados, but it's open to Barbados residents. So the, like the Frank Collymore that I won, but you'd have to be a, a resident there to enter stuff like that. But I would say we need more competitions in the Caribbean region, to be very honest with you in relation to those things. Um, there are international competitions that I recommend for short story writers, like the Commonwealth Short Story Prize, because it gives you 
again, that visibility in your work, you know, being shortlisted to say, hey, you're among the best. Um, it, it gives you that platform. So I recommend people enter the Commonwealth Short Story Prize for sure. Um, and the Wasa Theory that I won as well, it's, it's, it's another international prize. I recommend people enter that. I think the world is hungry for Caribbean stories and Caribbean voices. And the fact of the matter is, if it takes one writer, starting from first draft to publication, two years or three years, what no single one of us can write enough books that's going to satisfy the market demand. So in our best interest to have more stories and, you know, Caribbean stories being told. So where I tell people to start is just do, do your research, do your homework. Um, I know we haven't spoken about the book publishing side yet and how you get that deal. So I wait until we discuss that part to say further on that piece. Okay. But is there a cost to enter, um, book awards? Usually. So for Commonwealth Short Story Prize, there is none. Um, but most of them do have a small admin fee. And the reason for that is it's a way to spread out the admin costs. So they need people to hire people to read the stories and so. So you have to do your research because most of them would involve a cost. The bocus ones, bocus list fest ones don't. Commonwealth Short Story Prize is don't. But some of the journal kind of competitions and other competitions, you have to be prepared to spend money. It can range from like maybe 10 US to 25 US depending. Um, and that's non-refundable. So even if you don't win, you're not going to get back your money. But the reason they do that is to cover the cost of people reading and all the admin charges related to administering the, the prize. Awesome. And I know some of the prizes, the, the money is big, like the Booker Prize and others, you may win 5,000, 10,000 pounds or US. And so it's worth giving it a try. And listeners, as she said, you'll get feedback and that will help you on your journey so your research prizes to um the eligibility you'd be surprised how many people don't read eligibility eligibility page on a prize thing and entering when the prizes of people domicile in england and you live in jamaica you're wasting your time and their time so do your homework and do your research around um the prize itself i would say I have three more questions for you before we wrap up and uh, one from one of the members of my Entrepreneur Secrets membership group. Most persons in the Caribbean uh, don't vie for a traditional publishing deal. Why mm -hmm. did you vie for a traditional publishing deal, which is very often so hard to get? Talk to us about that. I mean, the times are changing, as they said, you know, you look at a Marlon James, you look at a Kai Miller, who I admire so much. They, and the people who before them paved the way, the Olive Cena, the Lorna Goodison, the Erna Broadbuck, it is possible to be traditionally published and to, you know, do, do to do reasonably well, I would say. And so the, the reason why I never did self-publishing is for me, I think you have to know the business of self-publishing. And this is where you come in, see Ruth, with your services to really train people because it is, it is specialist. You have to know your stuff. You can't just wing it when it comes to self-publishing, right? And I knew that I never had the brain power, the time, the inclination, all of that when it comes to self-publishing. Um, I have a very demanding job and life and stuff. And but I take my hat off to people who self-publish because the benefit is all of the profits are yours. Whereas traditional publishing, no, you're getting us, you get an advance, but again, depending on how much you think it is going to sell, your advance may not be big. And um, you don't really, unless you're like a six figure US person, like some book deals are like a million dollars, 500,000 US, but that's not the norm for most people. Most people is like, maybe five figures US thousand, you know, maybe it's a 20,000 or 30,000 US and that's the advance. And so that's, you know, if you don't ever sell enough to really make it back, that's all you're going to get. For me, my driving thing was not really the money part too. It was more that I want to, I want my books out in the world. You know, I want to have them, you know, the babies out there. You know, so I felt that the traditional publisher would already have their marketing and distribution channels and so on. And so I just leveraged that. 
you know, they do the work for me. But yes, you pay for it, but they do the work for me. And But for me, my end game is to have the books in as many readers' hands as possible. And I felt the traditional publisher would be able to do that for me better than I could for myself. Awesome. And one of the things traditional publishers are good at is getting the book, the print book, into stores and things like that. And uh, self-publishing is not for everybody. It is truly a lot hard of work. work. It's hard, hard work. work. And hard work. if a Caribbean author is going to get 10000 for a book or 20000 that's a lot of million dollars <laughs> in our economy. So it, true, it's, true, true. it is a win. So uh, what's the process? How does one land a traditional publishing deal? Okay, so first of all, you have to make sure that you research again. There's that word. Research your genre or your area. So know where you are placed. So if you're writing young adult fiction, you're doing literary fiction like myself, or you're doing what they call genre fiction. So you are either going to be a romance writer, um, you're going to be a romance writer, you're going to be a horror, suspense. Know where you're located. You know, know where your writing falls. Because the next step is going to be research the agents of the people that you like in that genre. So let's say you're a uh, you're, you want to write speculative fiction, which is fantasy, um, horror, those kind of things. You, you must know Nala Hopkinson's work. You must know Karen Nord's work. You must be reading that area because you're writing in it. So you have to know who are the contemporary people. So your next step would be to find out, well, who are the agents of these people? So I can query them, right? So it starts with a query letter to an agent. And there's lots of research online about how you query. So in my case, I queried, I think about seven or so agents and four of them came back and said they'd want to represent me. And so I then had meeting with them. Yeah, I had meetings with them and then decided based on the meetings who, who I would want. And um, the agent's job now, once they sign you up, they send your work out and they, arrange for the publisher slash editor now. So they will send it to all the big publishers or even independent publishers too. And they guide you to choose the best publisher for your work. But before you get to the agent, because a lot of publishers do not want you as a writer to write them directly. Some do. So again, research comes in. There are some smaller persons who say they don't mind. You can send them as a writer. Send them your book. Make sure you meet their submission requirements. Send it to them and they, they, they can publish you. But there are some who say, don't approach us unless you have an agent and the agent then approaches them. And so going back to query letters, do a good query letter. That's the starting point, right? However, you have to have a good product. And this is where coming back to honing your craft. You have to know that you have done your work. You've had this stuff edited. You've put the best possible work that you could put together. You've gotten feedback. You've Use the coach, a book coach, an editor, whoever, and you, you now have, okay, something I'm happy with. You write a query letter that draws the, draws the agent in. And there is an art and a craft to doing a query letter because guess what? These people get tons of query letters, right? A day, at least a hundred. My agent gets a hundred query letters a week, right? So you have to try to stand out among the whole of them. So you have to find a way to have a hook. You have to know what your book is about and be able to have what they call like an elevator pitch. So why should we read your book? Why does it matter? Why, does, why, why is it important? And why do you connect with it? You know? what? And so once you've cleared that hurdle now, you then have to do your further research again on the agent, meet with them. An agent relationship is one of trust. You have to, you know, meet with them and it should be somebody you are comfortable talking to who's available. Some agents out there, they have too many clients, don't have time for you, or they may be a little shady. So what is their reputation in the market? What else are they representing? Can you talk to maybe some of their clients who, who can give you the 411 on them before you sign up with them? And go, trust your God, how do, how do you feel when you're talking to them? Is it somebody you can call and say, boy, you know, I feel so conflicted because I don't write nothing and I don't know what to do myself or I don't know where to take this character and feel completely safe saying that, 
you know, are you odd? If you have celebrity agents, we can be in awe of and no, it has to be somebody you can relate to and talk to. And if they're good at their job, they know the market. They know, you know, when I had publishers, I had three publishers who offered to publish the novel, and my agent was able to say to me, okay, Sharma, this is the publisher I'm recommending for you. She, she's not offering the highest advance, so it's not going to be the most money. And even though it then would be less money for my agent, because the agent gets a percentage of your um you know, what you make. I think it's like 20 or 15%, I can't remember. But she was able to say to me, even though this is the lowest advance you're being offered, they're going to give you a two-book deal, one. And this editor is one who can be your editor for the rest of your career. In other words, she's somebody who, you know, I know her personality, I know your personality, and I think it's a fit. And I think she would allow you to be creative and play in a different box. Some publishers, they only want you to write one type of thing. You know, they want to know, okay, you are the romance person. You can't come out of this box and try something new. If that's fine for you, that's okay. Maybe you just want to write romance and that's fine. But if you know yourself as a, as a writer and know where you want to be in the next 5, 10, 20 years, you want an editor that will go with you. And same with that agent. Once you get an agent, it's not common to change agents because it's really like a lifelong relationship because, again, they're supposed to be with you through book one to book 10. Like Bernadine Everista, who won the Booker Prize. I think it was her eighth book that really blew up or something or the 10th. You know, and you want your agent to be there with you even if book one, two, and three didn't do well. They're still cheering you for book 11 and 12 and believe in you and believe in your art. So I would say find, just like in a relationship, find an agent and a publisher who's crazy about you. Not one that kind of, oh, on the fence, like you're neither here nor there, you're okay. They need to feel some kind of emotional connection to you and your work and want to stick with you through your career, so. <laughs> awesome, Sharma, we're gonna have to have you back especially after the book is published there is just so much in this area that we could learn but i want to say congratulations even um author of harry potter jk rowling was rejected so many times over 12 times chicken soup for the soul 130 times and you sent out seven letters and you got four positive responses you are awesome. <laughs> yeah, I would say God, God had a big hand in that one. I'm not taking oh, none wow. of the credit for that one. I'm not taking any of the credit for that. No, 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 no. I am so, I am so proud of you. And like I said, we'd have to have you back. Or we have to bring this interview to a close. You've you've done three courses in writing. You've won uh, several book awards. You've gotten a two part book deal, and so. One of my members is asking this question. How can I increase the chance of my novel becoming a book of study for students of literature? That's Antoinette, a Jamaican in Canada, asking that question. It's a book that can stand the test of time because the people you're doing in school are like maybe Olive Senior, Lorna Goodison. They didn't start out saying, okay, I want to write a book that's going to be on the syllabus. It's write a brilliant book, one that is well done, one that's quality. And then you can, you know, based on sales and prices and so reach out to the different ministry of education or whoever official and say, hey, how can how can I get this on there? But I know that it's not, it may not be as easy a task to get that done. So I would say don't necessarily hang your hat on that in terms of your measure of success. That's a good to do, good to aim for that. But for me, you have to redefine your success as a work that is enduring like write aim to write a piece of work a hundred years from now even if it's not on a school syllabus people can still people will still want to read so that would be my advice which doesn't really answer but that's the best i can, I can say of what comes to to mind i believe that's a brilliant answer because once the book is good then a teacher somebody will be interested in it and recommend it and then you can be intentional once you get good reviews and stuff that i'm going to start with one school two schools that kind of thing so i think that's a brilliant yeah, response and, and and i will use what you always say Kamika. there's somebody out there who needs your book who wants yes. your book who 
that book is, you know, even through the means of fiction, you know, you're telling a story that somebody can read and say, you know, I can relate to this. I understand how this character is thinking and feeling because I felt that way too. And, you know, you're, 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 you're get invested in the journey of the character and root for their success. And, you know, the book takes your reader on a journey too and a liberating one sometimes. So people out there want your book. Don't get so hung up on it if it's on the syllabus and don't get so hung up on it if it's in a prize or how many copies it sell. Get the book out. Just do, you know, what does justice to the story, your characters, and just put out the best product that you can and that you can stand behind and that you feel is authentic for you. Even if you feel the book is weird, crazy, sensual, wacky, there's going to be somebody out there who feels that, oh, this book fits me, you know, and that's who you're writing for. Awesome. So, Sharma, as we close out, I want you to talk to us a little bit more about the upcoming course and how we can get in touch with you if we want to learn to write fiction, win awards, and even get the coveted traditional book publishing <laughs> deal. Um, no problem. I would say that um, at the college, of course, it's, um, book coaching sessions that I'm running over a five-week period, it's different from the courses you may find online because it's not pre-recorded content and it's not to a group. It's working with you one-on-one -on -one in relation to your story and focusing on things like characterization and voice. I want to have a very small group of people because it's very hands-on. And if persons are interested, they can email sharmataylorwrites at gmail.com. So that's my first name, surname, and the word rights with an S at the end at gmail.com. Thank you, Sharma. This has just been awesome. And I look forward to interviewing you when you make the New York Times bestseller list. Oh, thank you. <laughs> was, thank you. <laughs> it was my pleasure. Thank you so much. That was a lovely interview with my friend, Dr. Sharma Taylor. And look out for her book in 2022, What a Mother's Love Does Not Teach You. And uh, remember that she has a program coming out. It's a book coaching program that will help Caribbean authors to write better stories, stories that will win book awards <laughs> and get traditional publishing deals as well, just like her. Dr. Taylor is just phenomenal. We talk very often about the rejections that you get when you pursue the traditional publishing route. But after sending out seven query letters, she got four positive responses. So this lady is amazing. So it would be interesting learning from her and it would be fitting to sit at her feet. So Sharma Taylor writes at gmail.com and uh, you can email her and find out more about her book coaching program to write nonfiction books. And guess what? That is going to make her an authorpreneur because she's not just depending on book sales, but she's going to use the knowledge that she has gained in writing, publishing books, winning awards, and she is going to leverage that, leverage her author status for the win beyond book sales and help others and develop another income stream. So that's perfect. When you go to authorpreneursecrets.com or extramilej8.com. I'm giving away a book called The Rocket Writer. You can download that for free and start your author journey. And then the Start Your Book Now course is a follow-up to that. This is a mini course. Again, it's a short course for $19.99 that will help you to put into practice what you learned in the Rocket Writer book and actually start the process and you'll be able to send me your outline and you get tips to finish the book. And so again, that's a giveaway. So go to extramilja.com and click on our tab, which speaks about writing and it will lead you to the Start Your Book Now course. And if you want to self-publish or learn more about independent publishing and publish on a budget, go to the same page, extramilja.com or authorpreneursecrets.com and download the publisher 
Starter Kit. It's a series of 10 training videos. The entire series is no more than an hour that will explain to you the publishing process and how you can reduce your publishing cost if you are struggling in that era like I was when I just started. And uh, I just want to encourage you, it is possible, we can do it. Dr. Sharma Taylor is doing it, I am doing it, and many others are doing it. So I want to encourage you to take charge of your publishing, go pen it to win it, and dominate authorpreneurship. Ta for now, until next time. Thanks for listening. I'm Tamara Francis, educator and editor. Don't forget to rate, review, subscribe, and share the podcast with your network. If you'd like to increase your impact and income with books, visit authorpreneursecrets.com for more resources, including the books, Pen It to Win It, and Authorpreneur Secrets. Join the Authorpreneur Secrets Academy membership group for courses, coaching, and community support to write, publish, and win with books. Enrollment is in January and June each year. You may also sign up for one of Ruth's Publishing Made Easy courses or private coaching to write and publish your next book. Until next time, go pen it to win it.